The Power is Project. Hello, friends. You've been hearing me talk about intake breathing for quite a while now. And so today I thought I'd show you um, what it's all about. So it comes in this nice little compartment here with the nose tabs and with the magnetic strip that goes over the top. And this little thing here connects the tabs put on your nose. Now, what I'm going to do is I will end up editing, editing this because I don't have a mirror in front of me. So when I come back, you're going to see the little tabs. So what I'll do, I'll show you here. So we'll take these tabs out like this. And so what you do is you take this little thing that has a magnet on the end and you bring it up like that. And there is your tab. Okay. And then what you do is you put it on your nose. Actually, I put it this way. You put one on this side and then you put one on this side and then the magnetic strip goes across. And what you'll find is that it works immediately. As soon as you put that strip across, it pulls the, the your nasal passage, the nose open so that you can breathe more. And as you're gonna find with this episode that I did with Carice, that in order to obtain better health, we need to breathe through our nose. And this is the thing that will do that. The reason why I love this product is because it eliminated my snoring problem that I had. And uh, it also obviously helps me with my, uh, with my athletic performance when I'm lifting weights and when I'm doing my stationary bike. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, you just it gives you more energy. And like I've said before, when I'm lifting weights, when I have this on, I'm doing two extra reps than when I don't. You wouldn't think it would make that big of a difference, but it really does. And the wonderful thing I love about this is the people who, who are part of Intake Breathing, Alex and Natalie, they're just great people and they offer a money back guarantee. If it doesn't work for you, for whatever reason, they will gladly return your money. They're just a great company. They're great people. And this is a great product. So I'll be right back with the little tabs on. And then I'll put the magnetic strip on and we'll see what it looks like. Okay. And we're back. So as you can see, I had the little tabs on my nose. And the two things I need to show you. One is is that when you pick up this tab, you, you'll notice these little white tabs a little uh, that are on the back of it. And those peel off and then they stick to your nose. Before you do that, however, step I forgot, is you're going to want to, and, they, and this comes with everything you need. So this is a little alcohol wipe. You just take this off and open this up, wipe your nose off before you stick these on, okay? And then, it's this easy. So you can see the way my nose looks now. The good thing I cleaned all the hair out of there. <laughs> and you can see how it opens it up immediately. And you and this just keeps you from breathing through your mouth in the night. And therefore, you don't need to snore any longer. And I know if you have a special somebody you sleep with, they're going to appreciate that. So now, as before, you can go over to intakebreathing.com and you can apply the promo code POWERS and you can get 20% off your order. So like I said, there's nothing to lose and everything to gain because you have a money back guarantee and Natalie and Alex are just two of the greatest people you'd ever want to meet, two really super nice people. And they stand behind their product and it's easy because it's a great product. So go over to intakebreathing.com Use the promo code POWERS, get your 20% off your, your order, and we'll, you'll be happy. And so will your partner. <laughs> so, Dr. Kimbrough, it's always great to have you on as a guest. Uh, it's The reason you're on today is because it's the 30th anniversary of your, of your book, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. And, you know, people who ask me, who, who've listened to this podcast, and they go, what in the world possessed you to buy a book? that was a black choice. And I, I go, you know, it intrigued me because here's my thought. I was like, if he has these stories of people who are successful, who are black, there's no reason why I can't be successful because 
I won't go through anything that black people have to go through because I do have certain privileges. I do have certain advantages. And so if these, I can't use those, I can't use excuses. If these, if, if these people who like Madam CJ Walker, who was basically born right after, you know, her parents were, were uh, freed and, and kicked off the, off the, uh, off the property with not a nickel to his name and she could become a millionaire what and where am I? What kind of <laughs> am I going to come up with? <laughs> you know, and so that's what that's what made me want to buy the book because I was like, wow, these people had to come overcome way more than I could ever dream of, and yet became successful. So that's why I bought your book, and that's why I found it so fascinating. And to this day, I, I it's one of my favorite books, honestly. Wow. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, Kurt. And you know, as I. Uh believe I shared with you the first time that we met, the only advantage that anybody would have is a belief in their capabilities. I mean, we all have, we're all capable of doing something in life. And when we become engaged, not only in our labor of love, but our area of excellence, then, you know, that gives us a determining factor in terms of what we were born to do, why we are here. And it sounds simplistic, but that's the truth. I mean, uh, as I shared, just that simple belief, you know, just the faith, you know, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to achievement, it's not your circumstances, it's not your conditions, it's not where you were born, it's not your education, it's not your contacts, it's not uh, who you know, what you know about who you know, blah, blah, blah. But it is your belief and it is your faith. And it is your determination. There are 20 human values, and all of them are positive. And the only difference between my version of thinking we're rich or black choice and, well, I shouldn't say Napoleon Hill because it is his version, what he used in the original 1937 volume, okay, were the profiles. That's it. The principles stay the same. Principles, you know, applications may change, but principles are non-changing. Principles are like the values. They are enjoined. So once you believe, and Napoleon Hill gives you six traits, six steps. Uh, again, he has 17 principles. The first four are more important than principles five through 17. And then the first four principles, he gives you six steps. Now, I don't care if you look at Steve Jobs. I don't care if you look at Bill Gates. I don't care if you look at Elon Musk. I don't care if you look at Zuckerberg, Dorsey, I mean, you name it. They all use some variation of those six steps. They all use a variation of those six steps. Number one, what is it you want to do? That's critical. If I stood on the street corner, here I am in the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia, the busiest intersection, Piedmont and Peachtree Street in Atlanta. And I interviewed the first 100 people that came by me and said, why are you here? What is it you've been sent to do? What are you going to do? I doubt if I could find five or six who could answer that question. I know. it's It absolutely amazes me when I talk to people and they truly, they, they'll tell me, I don't know what I want to do. And I go, how do you not know? Do you not put the time and effort into yourself to, I go, maybe it's not an easy answer, but you need to search it. You need to search your soul and find out what it is you want. And even if you don't know, you know, go with something you think you might want, give it a try. And you might find, oh, this is it. Or you might find that's not it. So that's one thing off your list. What is your, like, what would you tell people to do if they don't know what it is they want to do? How do they find that? Well, sooner or later, you got to become introspective. And to me, that's leading to your area of excellence. Again, going back when we spoke last time, three critical factors of your area of excellence. Number one, what do you love to do? What do you have a passion for? What can you throw your whole heart and soul into? Question number two, what would you do for free? You know, if no one paid you a dime, if no one gave you remuneration for your efforts, what would you do for free? And then last but not least, if you can't answer those two questions, Surely you can go to somebody who you respect and admire and ask him or her, what do you see me as? What do you think I would be good at what I'm, I'm doing? Sooner or later, you will find your area of excellence. And again, 
As, as I said, I don't care who you go to. Look at Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek is one of the hottest speakers on the planet, and his is a variation of Napoleon Hill. Start with why. Well, where in the world do you get that from, Simon? Come on, man. Start with why. <laughs> you know, you got right now, uh, okay, let's say here in the Atlanta area, you have 400 of the Fortune 500 and some variation. Either this is their headquarters or it's the regional office or it's their uh, southeastern office, whatever. I don't care what building you go into. There are two plaques somewhere in those buildings are going to have on the wall. Number one, their mission statement. And number two, their value or vision statement. So what is a mission statement? Exactly where we're going. Tell them this is our, this is IBM, this is Coca-Cola, this is Home Depot, this is the Atlanta Hawks, this is the Atlanta Falcons. Here's our mission statement. This is where we're going. And right next to it is a vision of value statement. What the hell is a vision of value statement? Why we are going there. And so why we are going there. On a personal level, people should be able to be able to explain both of those, right? Oh, that's yeah. Stephen Covey became one of the hottest speakers in the world because he came up with the seven habits. What is habit number one? Begin with the end in mind. <laughs> habit number one, begin with the end in mind. And he tells you in habit number one, Kurt, write a mission statement, your personal mission statement. And uh, yeah, the seven habits of successful people by Stephen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good book. It was a very good book. Um, and for people who don't know, who haven't read your book, I want to tell them what Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice is. It's, it tells the stories of the stories of successful black Americans, mm -hmm. how they made it and the obstacles and challenges that they faced and overcame to be able to make it. And Napoleon Hill, um, when he died, he left behind a manuscript about specific problems that Black Americans had to deal with. And then the, the Napoleon Hill Foundation had contacted you to have you finish that manuscript for him. Is that is that right? Exactly, Kurt. I was, um, again, I hate to be repetitive, whatever, but um, I shared with you that my first book was going to be What Makes the Great Great. And so when I got my doctorate degree, uh, I knew exactly what I want to do. I want to write this book. So my wife asked me, she said, how long will it take you? I said, about 18 months. It took me about seven years. But the first thing I did, Kurt, I pulled out a legal sheet of paper. I wrote 50 names on that sheet of paper. Men and women, peak performers, uh, entrepreneurs, multimillionaires, and the like. They didn't know me, but I certainly knew them. And I set out to interview them. After I interviewed those 50, I wrote another 50 names on the list and until I got to 150 interviews. And just think, Kurt, out of those 150 interviews came three books. What Makes the Great Great, um, Think and Grow With Your Black Choice, and The Wealth Choice. Okay, so here I am, I'm going around the country interviewing successful African Americans, and people were knocking on my doors for, you know, not only interviews, but for articles. And I was writing articles for magazines, non-defunct magazines right now, and this, that, and everything. Well, Success Magazine knocked on my door, and they asked me to write. They heard of what I was doing, and they asked me to write three articles. And being naive at the time, I was in New York, and I sat down with the editor of Success Magazine at that time, a gentleman by the name of Scott DeGarmo. He loved my writings, he loved the book, and I wasn't even, I was nowhere near finding a publisher for it, but I knew I had to wrap it up soon. So I said to him, my retort was, no, Scott, here, you go ahead, take the manuscript, pull anything out. He said, no, we want you to write it specifically for success. Well, sure enough, I wrote three, and a huge fan of Success Magazine, I didn't know what I know now, was W. Clement Stone. He gets the monthly issue in the mail, he reads it. it, took him a hot second when he read that article to call me up, how he got my number. Uh, that's a sermon for another Sunday, I don't know, but he got my phone number, called me up. Uh, I was out of, town, out of town at the time interviewing another gentleman, and my wife said, you know, you need to go upstairs and uh, check your voice machine. You sound like you got a number of phone calls. 
And sure enough, one was from W. Clement Stone. He asked if he wanted to meet me. Uh, the next morning, I returned the phone call. And uh, I didn't meet with them right off the bat because I had to go ahead and raise the money for the airline ticket from Atlanta to Chicago and the rent a car. So it took me about two weeks to do that. And the rest was history. So um, and he shared in that meeting with me that, you know, hey, it says at the end of this article that, that you're writing a book, African-American success, this that, and everything. And I said, yes, sir, that's right. And he said, you're not the first person to, to do this. And I said, I'm not. And then that's when he dropped those 100 pages. And I don't know if I showed them to you, but you're in my study right now. And I can show you those 100 pages. So, you know, it was a date with destiny. And there were so many factors, Kurt, that I had my date with destiny November 4th, 1986. Well, in the fall of 1908, um, with Andrew Carnegie, Napoleon Hill had his date with destiny. In 1908, there was a knock on the door to Andrew Carnegie's 64-room mansion on Fifth Avenue, New York, overlooking Central Park. His butler goes down to the door, and who is it? It's Napoleon Hill, who was a writer for Bob Taylor Magazine at the time, set up an hour interview with Andrew Carnegie. And that hour interview turned into three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And before that interview was finalized on that Sunday afternoon, that's when Andrew Carnegie asked a young, impressionable Napoleon Hill, just like you interviewed me over the weekend, would you be so inclined if I set the interviews up for you? Would you go out and interview Henry Ford? Would you go out and interview Thomas Edison? Would you interview Al uh, Alexander Graham Bell? Would you interview Charles Goodyear? Would you interview uh, William K. Wrigley? And on and on and on and on. He told them, he says, I'm not going to pay you a dime to write this book. I will reimburse you for any outlaying costs that you have. But I know if you write this book and take those interviews and place them in a single volume, that will create your first fortune. And Hill answered yes. And... The rest is history. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said it was your date with destiny. But would you? I think it's important that people understand that the reason your date with destiny and and Napoleon Hill's date with destiny and anyone's date with destiny is because they put action into motion. Like yeah. you started doing things. Like you didn't just sit back and go, well. I'm, you know, I'm Dr. Dennis Kimbrough and people are going to come to me and, you know, and, and doors are just going to open you, you in your head, you had a mindset that, action. Yep. and that you, you made these things happen. This date of, you know, of destiny, as you call it, happened because of what you had in your mind and what you, and the actions that you did. And I think that's what a lot of people, I, they miss out on. I don't know how they miss out on it, but you know, you said something about you wrote these names down. And the funny thing is, on a much smaller scale, I did the same thing when I started this podcast. I wrote down uh, a top 20 list of people that uh, that I want to interview. And mind you, I only have two of those 20, but that's two. Like, I have you and I have Stan Efferdine, who's the world's strongest bodybuilder. I, mm -hmm. you, know, these, you were two of my top ones, and you were in, honestly in my top three. <laughs> um but to be able to get you, I would never be able to do that if I hadn't contacted you. And I think that's where people, they, they give up before they even start. You, you know, because I looked at it like this. The worst you could do is say no. <laughs> you, know, that's, oh, yeah. you know, but people are so afraid of being, um, you know, told no, that they don't even ask. And, and they, they, you know, they don't even, they stop before they even begin. And that's the thing about persistence. I mean, failure is never failure until it's accepted as such. And you've got to realize that you're the only individual who keeps score. And that idea was shared with me with John Johnson, the founder of Johnson uh, Publication. But when it comes to success, success is a statistical event. That's all it is. You know, just like you wrote down two names and I wrote down 50. Well, Jeff Bezos did the same thing. You know, when he left Wall Street as a day trader with a hedge fund and flew back to his parents' home in Seattle 
and built Amazon out of their garage. The first thing that he did, he wrote 60 names on a sheet of paper. And these 60 names, he was going to approach each of them, hoping to get $20,000 from it in terms of investment. Well, he didn't get 60 people to invest. He only got 20 people to invest. But his parents were one of the 20 who gave him their entire life savings. So, um, you know, again, like I said, Kurt, you know, principles stay the same, but the applications can change. So that's what we got to focus in on. Success always leaves footprints, always leaves footprints. Just like Tony Robbins tells you, you got to change your standards. That is the first step. He tells you, change your standards. Number one, you are where you are in life right now by the standards you have set. You are where you are health-wise. Why does Robin, Robin Sharma always focus on health? Because if you take care of your body first, health set, heart set, soul set, mindset, if you take care of your body first, all of that will bleed into every other aspect in your life. It will bleed. So you are where you are in life right now in terms of your health. You are where you are in life right now in terms of the standards that you have set in your finances, the standards you have set with your family. So that's number one, raise your standards there. Number two, turn your should do's into must do's. Turn your, you know, your want to's into have to's. That's why I love that book, Letters to a Young Poet from Relke. And here's the apprentice poet, and he sends Relke, the master author, the master writer, his best poetry, hoping that Relke might read it. Well, not only did Relke read it, but he sent the poems back to that young apprentice, that young aspiring poet with notes in the margin. And the young aspiring poet says to Relke, how can I be a master writer like you? How can I write poetry like you? And what did Relke tell that young apprentice? He said, don't write poetry because you want to. Write poetry because you have to, because your very existence depends on it. And here is a young Beyonce Noel. She was barely 14 years old. And she finally gets a producer for her music. And what's the first thing that producer does to a young Beyonce Noel at age 14? Gives her one of Michael Jackson's songs. And this is one of his songs that never hit the billboards. Of, forget the top 50. This song never hit the top 100. That's right, Michael Jackson had some songs that didn't even hit the top 100. He said, I want you to listen to it and made her listen to it. Sometimes she would go to the music studio and instead of singing, instead of practicing, she would sit there and he would have that song on repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. He said, why in the world are you forcing me to listen to this one song? He said, because this is where you will find the heart and soul of Michael Jackson. Whoa, man. It is in the recesses of life that sometimes we have our greatest growth and personal development. Simplistic? Oh, uh, yeah, you can say it's simplistic. I mean, just like the books that I'm working on now, I'm looking at the, the icons of the Black community. And in just my small bit of research, okay, I'm one year into it, and just a small bit of research, Kurt, I have found the three critical factors. Three critical factors of what we call iconic. The three critical factors. Number one, deliberate practice. Deliberate practice. When no one is looking, deliberate practice. Number two, get out and seek the best. Get around the best. Get around the best. Number one, deliberate practice. Number two, get around and seek the best. And number three, master your craft. That's powerful, man. That's the book all by itself right there. You go ahead and you align with these three critical factors. Yeah. What, did my, what did my grandmother say on Sunday for Sunday dinner? That's good all by itself. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need nothing else. <laughs> so why? Do, what do you think holds the majority of people back from doing these things? Like it, it, as if, because honestly, you know, this, this information has been out there for years and years and years. If, if they read your book, if they read Tony Robbins, if they read you know, or, or watch 
you know, anything that's on TV that's positive, like, you know, um, by about Napoleon Hill or anything like that, this information has been out there. And I know many people read it. And what what happens between them reading it, understanding it, and then not implementing it? Well, just like the master carpenter from Gallon Lee says, uh, you know the color of the sky, but you don't know the sign of the times. I mean, he answered that question. You take the Bible, all 66 books, all by 40 authors and blah, 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 and say, just give me the, the cliff notes of the Bible. Just tell me exactly what I need. I don't have time to re- go from Genesis, you know, to oh, God. I don't have time for that. Just tell me what I need to know. Number one, believe. Believe in yourself when no one else will. Don't care what others say. Don't care about the thinking of others. No, you focus on you first. So number one is believe. And number two, be not afraid. Again, going back to Nelson Mandela. And what did Nelson Mandela say, Kurt? He said, don't pay attention when, when interacting with others. Don't watch their lips. Don't hear what they have to say. Spend your time looking at their feet, where they're going and what they're doing. If, if we just focus in on that, believing in ourselves and move from fear to fearless. Now, why people don't do that, uh, that's a sermon for another Sunday. There are a host of factors that go into that. Maybe they think they don't have the money. Maybe they didn't think they have the resources. Maybe they suffer from low self-esteem. Maybe they got some issues in their life that they've got to overcome. But when it all comes down, when you go from the broad to the specific, when you go from the wide to the narrow, and you put it in a light, nice little tight box with the bow on it, and you open that box up, or you get your journal articles, and you open it up, and the only thing that makes a difference is the page that says, believe, oh, and this says, be not afraid. That's all I need. There it is. That's all I needed, man. I think I think part of it comes down to that, you know, I don't think the majority of people out there love themselves. Even the ones who say they do, they don't treat, like right. you said where are their feet going? Their actions show they don't love themselves. And I think yeah. when you don't love yourself, you, you don't believe in yourself. You don't, yeah. you don't trust yourself. And, and so that's why I think, especially in this country, we have a lot of people are hurting and that's why they lash out. That's why they try to hurt other people. Cause as the saying goes, hurt people, hurt people. And, and I, and we see that constantly now, especially with social media and, um, and, and so they're looking for some sort of something to make them feel better. And they've been programmed to believe that things make them happy. And so what we, I think. No, we, you, know, you, never, you never look for fulfillment outside of right. yourself. The but kingdom we, is within. Mm-hmm. Right. But what, I, I, yeah, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's okay. But what you're finding is, and I know that you, that you see this, that you see people sacrificing long-term success for short-term pleasure and i think that's because they're looking for something to make them feel better i mean would you would you agree with that or would you like to elaborate on that or well yeah well let me give you my take on it abraham maslow said that he said the highest form of social existence is self-actualization and what did maslow mean by that well our first inclination is food shelter and clothing got to get food shelter and clothing then you get to the point where I want better food, shelter, and clothing. I want an upgrade, blah, blah, blah. Then you get to the point where, you know, I want the best food, shelter, and clothing. Well, you get to a point, according to Maslow, Kurt, the highest form of self-actualization is I want food, shelter, and clothing for my fellow man, fellow woman. But you hit the proverbial nail on the head. You were the one that brought it up, not me. You spoke of love. Again, going back, there's only 20 human values and the most enduring is love. And when you said they don't love themselves, there's two types of love. Okay, there's filial love. Let's come what the hell is filial love? Filial love is kind of, sort of, when it's convenient type of love. Filial love is built on convenience, you know. Uh, oh, girl, you know, uh, uh, if I love you, I would, yeah, if you go out with me tonight, I'll love you in the morning type of thing. Filial love is, you know, the type of love, like I said, is built on convenience and this, that, and everything. Well, there's another type of love, and it's called agape love. And what is agape love? 
by any means necessary, unconditional love. Unconditional love. The last interview that Mother Teresa had here in the United States was in Phoenix, Arizona, before she flew back to India and she made her transition. She was on a little tiny radio station in Phoenix, Arizona for an interview, Kurt. And everybody in the Phoenix area and Arizona couldn't believe how did this little 50 watt radio station get this icon, Mother Teresa in the studio on this show. And the producer who was part owner of the radio station was just throwing himself over Mother Teresa with just thanks and gratitude. Mother Teresa, I can't believe you're sitting in my studio. I can't believe you're here on my radio station speaking to all my listeners. Mother Teresa, there's got to be something that I can do for you. What can I do for you to repay you? And Mother Teresa was very calm. She said, there's nothing you can do for me. All I want to do, the only reason why I'm on your radio show, I just want to talk about the new homeless shelter that's opening up here in, in Phoenix. And then he said, well, Mother Teresa, there's got to be something I can do for you. How about if we have a radio farm where we, we raise money and I can give you the money and you can take back to India and, you know, give it to the folks who run your orphanage. And she says, no, 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 no. That is totally unnecessary. I'm just here to talk about the new homeless shelter that's opening up here in Phoenix. And he said, no, my God, Mother Teresa, there's got to be something I can do for you. I can tell you what, you know, we can go ahead, we can have a clothing drive so the kids in your orphanages have new clothes to wear and we can go ahead and send it back to India. And she says, no, 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 that's not necessary. I'm just here to talk about the new homeless shelter that's opening up in Phoenix. And he says, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, there's got to be something I can do for you. And finally, he hits a nerve. She says, you know what? You seem like a nice individual. And I'm going to take you up on that. There is something you can do for me. And he says, what is it, Mother Teresa? He says, you see that blanket you have sitting over there on that chair? Yes, I want you to take that blanket and between two and three o'clock tomorrow morning, I want you to go to downtown Phoenix and I want you to find somebody who's sleeping in the street and give them this blanket and find somebody who believes that they are alone and tell them that they're not. That's what you can do for me. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> That's unconditional love, Kurt powers yes, and that's yes. the only love that endures and just like just like um uh uh kevin uh the the basketball player for um he played for he played for oklahoma kept uh kevin durant yeah okay <laughs> several years ago when kevin durant was uh crowned the mvp and they had the honor ceremony for him. And they gave him the trophy. And he stood up at that podium and he says, I'm honored for this award. But you see that woman over there pointing to his mother. You see that woman over there? She's the real MVP. She worked two thankless jobs. And in between her jobs, working two jobs a day, she would come home and she would make sure that me and my brothers you know, had a warm place to stay. We had dinner that night. We were doing our homework and went right back to the second job. And by the time we're getting ready to leave and go for school in the morning, she's barely catching sleep before she goes to her first job again. She's the real MVP. She placed a roof over our head. She found a way out of nowhere. You want to find the MVP? Give it to her. And man, it was so quiet at that ceremony. And what did Kevin Durant's mother do for a living? She worked on the assembly line for Frito Lakes, stuffing Fritos into a bag. Imagine doing that for the rest of your life. Yeah. But you find a way to make a difference. Again, going back to Nelson Mandela, it's not how big, it's not how great, not how affluent, how wealthy, how rich. How many lives have you impacted? on this journey called life. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I think that unconditional love is, is it's out there, 
<laughs> it's much more rare than uh, that love that's there for convenience, you know? So um, I, I think I know what your answer is going to be to this question, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you feel there are more or less opportunities today than when you first wrote thinking? Oh about- man, there's so many opportunities out there. It's unbelievable. Do you know what happens the end? Well, let, let's look to see what's going to happen within five years. And then let's look what's going to happen just the end of this decade. All right. At the end of this decade, by here we are, 2021, by 2029, Ford Motor Company will no longer sell gas powered cars throughout Europe. No more. They are going totally electric in Europe. They're converting their plant. That's it. Not going to manufacture a gas car, not going to sell a gas car. And you've got eight years if you want to buy one and you live anywhere near York is right there. Blah, blah, blah. That's number one. Number two, five years, six years tops. Apple's coming out with a self-autonomous car. I mean, that's it. Steve Jobs told you that before he transitioned. He said, Steve Jobs told you in 2007 when he came up with this bad boy, he said, don't get excited. This is not the goal. You know, one day this is going to let you into the car. He says, you know, you won't need a key. You just go ahead and click on this. And then when you get in the car, you look at the dashboard. It's just one big iPhone and you just sit back and it just drives you wherever you want to go. And you can't stop that. Now, you can be, a, you can look at change, Kurt, and you can say change is friend or change is foe. Well, change is friend. And you're going to have to jump on board and look for opportunities. There's going to be so many unbelievable opportunities throughout this decade and the decade to come. But you got to come to the realization there are, listen, two jobs or two businesses you always run. What are the two jobs or two businesses? The job of business that you're in right now and the job of business or enterprise entrepreneurship that's going to become in five years. And you got to focus on both of them. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. So with all the opportunities that you talk about that are in our future, that are are not only here, that there's so much more and there's so much more coming, then you, you have people who are so you know, if you go on social media, you would think the world's ending because everybody's looking at the negative rather than the positive. And, and so I guess, you know, it's just about their, again, you're like you said earlier, the mindset, what are you going to focus on? You're going to focus on the positives of the future. Are you going to focus on the negatives? And well, you do you focus on neither. You focus on truth. That's what you focus in on. What came first chicken or the egg? Neither came first. God came first. And what is God? Well, God is true. So what is the truth? There's ample opportunity around whether you see it or not. I don't I don't know what you see. You know, it's just like, again, going back to seven habits of highly effective people. Stephen Covey uses that paradigm where he shows a picture and he asks the readers, what do you see in the picture? Do you see the young maiden or do you see the elderly old woman? And he says today in today's environment, you got to be able to see both pictures. You got to be able to see both because if you just see the one, Kurt, if you just see the one, you're going to be left behind because the, the one that you don't see is the one that has become. Okay, case in point, just think what Uber and Lyft did to yellow taxi cab drivers, knocked out an entire energy, you know, entire industry. All right, we were just talking about the Apple car. What's going to happen to Uber and Lyft? So, okay, and uh, just think of all the, the positions that artificial intelligence has placed right now with, between the computer and the monitor. The more that's invented, the more that needs to be invented, okay? So just think of the, the, what we enjoy right now that's sooner or later going to become obsolete. So just the idea that we are focusing in on truth. What do you see? Here I am in Atlanta, Georgia, and let's go down to Savannah, Georgia, and look out across the Atlantic Ocean. You would tell me that the sky and the water meet. Well, the sky and the water never meet. There's no such thing as gravity if the sky and the water meet. 
If you and I are standing on railroad tracks, you look down the train tracks, you would say, Dennis, it looks like the tracks are coming together. Well, the tracks could never come together, otherwise the train would fall off the tracks. You don't focus in with your mind's eye because, some, excuse me, you don't focus in with your physical eye because sometimes your physical eye will lie to you. You focus in on your mind's eye. Begin with the end in mind. Now that's a metaphor for life. So the more that's created, the more that's invented, the more that needs to be invented. I look here in my study, all the things I tell my students all the time, just look around. Tell me everything that you see right now that you couldn't purchase more than five years ago. Just look around to see what you have right now. Oh man, I, I got a new printer. I got a new, I got a new monitor. Oh man, I got a new webcam. I have that. That's less than five years old. Let me see what else I have here. Um, oh yeah, how could I forget? I got a brand new microphone. That was an upgrade. And look at this. Just think of all the upgrades I got within the last sixty days. Right. Certain things I can do on my iPhone that I couldn't do before. So that is the truth. Now, you're going to have problems and you're going to have challenges in life when you turn a deaf ear, when you turn a blind eye to the truth. And what is truth? Truth is love. Truth is love, man. Again, going back to what you said. Man, that is powerful. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, your second book that you had come out with, uh, just because, uh, and it was called What Makes the Great Great? And that came out um, like a few years later, like in 98 or something? 94. 94, okay, 94. What What are the top, like let's say two or three, characteristics that the, that make great people great? What is it that sets them apart from everybody else? Okay, uh, and, again, and again, when it comes down to greatness, greatness is not about genetics. Greatness is about mechanics. Big difference. It's not your genes. It's not your bloodline. It's not your lineage. It's none of that. You know, again, everything that we discussed, Four common factors. Number one, Kurt, they dream big dreams. Now, the dreams, some, you know, it depends on their industry, their organization, their vocation, what do they want to do in life? You can't throw a dollar figure on that. You can't put a dollar figure on success. Again, I go back to the definition of success, the same definition that Earl Nightingale used. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal or ideal. That's the definition that I abide by, too. So number one, they dream big dreams. They had a dream, a passion, something they desperately wanted to accomplish in life. Number two, they were inner-directed versus outer-directed. They weren't so quick to believe friends or family members who said, you can't do this, you can't do that. What do we call it right now? We call it disruption. What do we call it right now? We call it coloring outside the lines. What do we call it right now is what, you know, Robert Frost, two roads diverged in the wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. You are unique. Can't succeed being like everybody else. The opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is conformity. And you are blessed to live in a capitalistic economy that rewards differentiation. That rewards differentiation. Now, there are two roles when we talk about differentiation. And it's not so much who are the, who are the naysayers, who are the non-believers, who are the unachievers, who are the folks poo-pooing your differentiation. Be more concerned with the folks who are rewarding your differentiation, rewarding your uniqueness. You know, if you, you know, here you are, this is the only country, and this is part of the problem, Kurt. This is the only country on the planet that'll take poor people, put them around other poor people, and then wonder why no one's life gets better. 
Okay, so here you are, you're around poor people, and you decide that you're going to bust loose. You decide that you're going to make a difference. Well, the first thing you're going to hear, you're going to hear the disruption, the cynics, the doubters, the naysayers, the chronic complainers. So it's not so much the fact that, you know, whether you're being respected, it's more important of who respects you. So in a directive versus out of directive. Number three, what did I say? You got to become a student of the craft, readers of leaders. I don't care if you go to college, there's two forms of education, Kurt. There's formal education and there's informal education. Formal education will get you a degree, will get you a job. Informal education will make you rich, will create your fortune. So you got to become a student of the craft. You got to learn. And then last but not least, what we talked about earlier, they flat out refuse to fail. You know, they flat out refuse to fail. If the average individual you shared with me some of the stuff that you had to go through to get your podcast and blah, blah, blah. If the average individual had to maybe in your early days walk a mile in your shoes, they'd probably trip. They probably say, man, this isn't for me. I, I can't put up this nonsense. This is BS, blah, 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 blah. But it was that learning process that, you know, that process that you were learning, that you were formulating, that you were crafting at the time. Well, I'm not going to do this because I know what doesn't work. And this is the way that I approach new clients that I want on my show, because I think this is a lot more effective. And what I'm going to do, I got some good shows every year that I'm on. I'm going to take the top 10 and I'm going to start a blog. And the blog is eventually going to lead to a book. I mean, you've mastered your craft. You know what works. And out of that, you know, came that classroom that you were in that included your successes that included your eventual successes. In other words, that you had to take time. That included your failures. So those are the four keys that I found in all of them. And I interviewed Olympic athletes, multimillionaires, billionaires, folks who stopped, well, they all started with nothing. And I hate that phrase, started with nothing. No, you always got something. You always had something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because of, because of your book and because of your words and, and, and many others, mind you, that the reason I do the things I do, and I know people look at me sometimes and they think I'm crazy, but what you said when you hit on, you said they dream big. And I have a big dream. I have the dream of, of overtaking Joe Rogan as the number one podcast. Now, I know where I'm at. I'm, I'm realistic about that. And I know that in order for me to get to that point, that I can't just sit back and and just do podcasts. I need to get better myself because Joe Rogan is great at what he does. Absolutely the best. If I want to be the best, you know, then I got to become the best, as as uh, Ric Flair would say. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and well, you you are you are the best. You're the best version of Kurt Powers. And but I can I mean, you can't you you're Kurt Powers. You can't be Joe Rogan. No, and I I, I can't be any other speaker or writer. I'm the best version of what I can be. Exactly. And I want to make the ver I want to make a better version of me. And the only way I do that is by working on me. Not exactly. So um and the other thing is is that you know I remember you talking about when you dream big, you have to have a commitment to that dream. Like you you've got to be committed to it. Otherwise it, it's not going to go anywhere. The passionate committed mind. And the passionate committed mind leads to conviction. So um, it's just, the, the, as I said before, the passion committed mind cannot be defeated. There's so many examples of what, what do they have? Well, they only had one thing. What was that one thing? A passionate committed mind. They were not going to be defeated. And what do we know about conviction? Conviction is a force multiplier. It is a force multiplier. You know, every, everything starts with one individual. You know, uh, as I've shared on a number of times, ma'am, don't wait for the masses. The masses never get it, Kurt. No, the no. masses never get it. Start with that one committed soul. Start with the soloist. Don't worry about the choir. One day the choir will be there. The masses never get it right. I shared with you before, do you think the masses got together and said, hey, let's end slavery and 1700s and 1800s no 
You just had a few committed souls. You had Harriet Tubman. You had Ida B. Wells. You had a, a number of folks. You had Frederick Douglass and the like. Don't wait for the masses. Do you think the masses told Steve Jobs that we need an iPhone? No. Steve Jobs started with himself. He had, you can go on and on and on and on and on. Don't wait for the masses. Start with that one committed soul. And I'd like to reiterate something that you said, because, again, I, I just believe your words of wisdom. I, I, you know, sometimes you get you you put out so much wisdom. I think that it, some of it may go over people's heads because they don't quite catch it. And I go you know, and listen, I'm going to tell people when you when I have Dr. Kimbrough on my show, watch it over and over, because I promise you I've done that and you will learn something new every time because there's just so much there that you you can't possibly get it all the first time around. You know, you said, you know, about um, surrounding yourself with the best and, th and that came back around when you were just talking and that's, you know, th that's pivotal. It's actually pivotal. I mean, because like you said, if you surround, if you're poor and you surround yourself with poor people, you're going to be poor. If, you know, it doesn't matter what group you're in, you're going to become like that group. So if you don't like where you're at, look around you and see who's around. You. <laughs> Birds of a feather certainly flock together, man. And it's not so much surround yourself by the best. That is critical. But as that African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. And it does help. It does help is that you're not the sharpest in the crowd. So, yeah, and, and that's, you know, I, I have become a student of success, always looking for somebody else. We, we, what you do and what I do are just different variations of the same journey. You're on the podcast where I'm sitting with folks. Um, I may not be broadcasting it like you, but I got my little tape player. Or I got my little video phone right there, and I'm just taking notes to go ahead and to throw in a book to share with the same audience. Well, speaking of books, you had one other book, The Wealth Choice, Success Secrets of Black Millionaires. And that was based off a seven-year study um, that was done and uh, of the thousand wealthiest uh, black Americans, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I want, to, I want to reiterate the commitment that you had to your books, to your dreams, to everything that you wanted to accomplish, that you were willing to put the time, the work, and the effort in. And without that, your dreams are your dreams just remain dreams. And and I think that's one of the things that people need to understand is that you got to where you're at today because of the actions that you put in place. Because as you said, Nelson Mandela says, look what their feet are you know, going. And if their feet are going in that direction, they're going to succeed. If they're not moving, they're not going, they're not going anywhere. Yeah. And see that that's a part of the universe. Again, you know, um, when you start, when you, again, going back to Steve Jobs, he would always ask people, when are you going to poke a hole into the universe? Once you take that first step, money will be given to you if you need money. Resources will be given to you if you need resources. Time and contacts will be given to you if you need time and contacts. So here I am in class. And right before we're about to, you know, dive into the case study in my MBA class, a student just asked a question, Dr. Kimber, what are you working on now? And I shared with them, it wasn't even called the wealth choice. And I said, well, I'm, you know, uh, I'm in the beginning stages of uh, interviewing seven figure folks, blah, blah, blah. And um, he said, are you using a resource tool? I said, yeah, funny you should ask them. I got a survey. And I'll tell you what, during the next class, I'll bring the survey in. You guys are hot shot MBAs. I'll let you go for it. And so the next class, Kurt, on the desk um, to everybody in my class was a survey that I was using. The survey was uh, 118 questions. It was 20 pages, glossy picture, all the questions. I mean, I spent a good deal of money on that survey and bam. Well, they X some questions out. They added some questions in there, blah, blah, blah. And I'm glad they did. I reformulated that survey and then I beta tested it. In other words, I gave the survey to a number of black million, millionaires. And once they completed the survey, I asked them, 
tell me about the questions. Are there any questions I should delete or any questions I should add? And they said, no, I think you got everything tight. And after that beta test, that's when I rolled out with it. That's when I started passing out, sending it all over the country and the like. And after seven years, I had an opportunity. I had more than 1,000 responses and the like, which was a representative sample of really what's out there in the hidden land. Well, I want to congratulate you on on 30 years of Think and Grow Rich, a black choice. Um, yeah. You know, I just, to me, it's still one of the, the best books out there. And Thank you ask me what to what to read i because again that book shows everyone who reads it that we all have obstacles we have to overcome but mm-hmm. you know you're not going to very few people can say oh my my challenges are greater than the people who who are in this book because that's just that's not true and so you know it just shows that regardless of what challenges you have and, you know, it, it really does come down to, as you've said over and over, it comes down to the mindset because, you know, if you, if you think, you know, Henry Ford, I look at my, one of my favorite saying, <laughs> whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, exactly. And I just, I absolutely love having you on the show. I, I want to have you on the show again, and you're welcome <laughs> to, uh, to come back whenever you want, if you want to, pot if you want to put it out there i'll be happy (laughs) (laughs) well kurt i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to send you a link to a video i'm not going to tell you what it's about and i'm going to send it to you after the end of the show and once you take a look at it you can go ahead and either text or email your thoughts i will do that i appreciate that very much um you stay on the line with me because i'm i'll go ahead and end the show now but I want to talk to you about the, the books and, uh, and, and, uh, and then we'll take care of that. Okay. Okay. All right, folks. Well, that's our show again. Thanks to Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. As always, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have him on the show. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, take care, be safe and wear your mask. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Record this again. Okay. Where is it? Uh, is it recording? Yes. All right. Go ahead. All right. So level five leadership. Yep. Level five leadership in terms of your values, in terms of your character and integrity. Okay. Level one, I follow you because I must follow you. You're my boss. You're my supervisor. You give me my paycheck the 15th and 30th of every month, blah, blah, blah. You write my review out. Okay. So level one is I follow you because I have to follow you. Level two, I follow you because I want to follow you. Level three, I follow you for what you've done for the, you know, for others. Level four, I follow you for what you've done for the organization. But level five leadership, I follow you because of what you stand for, your brand, your beliefs. So that's the inspiring character. That's the inspiring trait, the attribute, the quality that really moves mountains. I wish we could get you in front of Congress to speak to them because <laughs> I, I know that 99.9% of them would have their heads down. If you were to talk to them, if you talk to them about not compromising their integrity, mm-hmm. they wouldn't even be able to look you in the eye, except for the ones who just don't care. You know, the, sure. those, those, uh, the, or well, some- that, 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 that was it. I mean, you know, you got a lot of folks out there. Okay. You got Democrats, you got liberals, you got, Republicans, you got conservatives. But when you look at conservative, there's a big difference between Republican and conservative. I mean, Kurt, here I am in my study. Okay, we go through these uh, French stores right here, and you'll see rows and rows and rows and rows and rows all the way up to the ceiling of books. Here I am as an African American male. I damn near have every book Milton Friedman wrote. I met Milton Friedman. I met I met Milton Friedman. I met uh, uh, so many Nobel laureates from the Friedman School. So that's number one. I damn near got every book Milton Friedman wrote. I know I had every book that Ludwig von Mises wrote. He was libertarian. Okay. At one time, I had every book. That well, I know I have every book that Tom Sowell wrote. 
And at one time, I have every book that I had William Buckley's books. I had what I'm trying to say is, okay, you tell me that you're conservative. Who brought this conservative mindset? Did you read Edmund Burke? Did you read John Locke? Did you read Cato the Elder? Mm -hmm. Did you read Eric Hoffer, True Believer? Okay. Tell me your thoughts about Anne Rand when you read Anne Rand's books. I can give you my thoughts on Anne Rand. I was in college when I read William Buckley, God and Man at Yale, when he was having his uh, you know, debates with uh, James Baldwin. I could go on and on and on and on. And so that's what led me to these beliefs right now. I mean, you can go ahead and you can read them, man. It's one thing to say that, okay, I espouse it. Well, show me where you read Alexander Hamilton. Right. Show, show me show me where you, where, you, where you read that. He's the father of the treasury, man. You tell me, what did he say that really impacted your life? When I shook Milton Friedman's hand and said, Dr. Friedman, I can't believe I'm meeting you. I mean, I got free to choose capitalism and freedom. I was a junior undergrad when I read Capitalism and Freedom because capitalism was being poo-pooed and you're going to take the word capitalism and freedom and marry it? That took me in a completely different direction, man. I had damn near at the time every book that Karl Marx and Lenin ever wrote, man. I was reading, I was... I was digesting that, and there's still a place for that. You need both. And then I went back and I read Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And what did he say in the Wealth of Nations? I allow you to pursue your divine self-interest. You allow me to pursue my divine self-interest. And who will benefit? Invisible and the greater good. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's what we can do for others. That's Adam Smith. And Adam Smith wasn't even an economist, Kurt. He was a moral philosopher. And there were two documents. Everybody focused on 1776. We signed the Declaration of Independence. But there was another document that they threw away, that they discarded, that was developed by Quakers at the same time. There were two documents, and they signed one, but they didn't sign the other. And what was the other document? You couldn't hold office if you were a slave owner. And they chucked it, man. Yeah, you yeah. had an opportunity to, bam, to slap your hand down and say, we're going to solve this problem right now. You don't have to worry about that, Dennis Kimbrough, and your grandchildren, Kurt Powers, and your grandchildren. They had, don't have to worry about this. We're going to finally open this door. So, yeah, I went off on a tangent, but that people never hear that. They never hear or see that side of me. And I'm saying, I'm not sitting up here watching MSNBC, Fox News 24-7. I actually read this stuff, man. Well, and that's the difference between you and I, I will honestly admit, I'm not going into, I, not going into near the research you have, but I do research my stuff before I come to an opinion. And what I do is what you did. I look at all the different viewpoints, all the different perspectives before I make a, a decision on where I stand on things. And very few people do that. They just, like you said, they follow the masses, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they don't look to see if what's being told to them is truth. They, you know, they'll, they'll read a byline and they go, Oh, that's someone that I like. So I believe it. And unfortunately there's so much, not even misinformation, they're just outright lies or what they are. And mm -hmm. people are being misled because they refuse to open their eyes. They're not misled because they're stupid. They're just lazy. They just refuse to look and they don't now, want to know. Now, what are the odds that you would meet somebody? And again, I'm in my study and over there, I got my library, but here in this area, I got, like I told you before, the 50 books that had a profound impact on my life that are near and dear to my heart. And here I am, what are the odds that you would meet somebody and talk to them that two of the 50 that had a profound impact on their life, 
The, the Soul of Black Folk by W.B. Du Bois. But the Road to Serfdom by Frederick Hayek. <laughs> Milton Friedman read this book for growth and development. This is what changed Milton Friedman. And here it is, all highlighted. All notes, you can see the highlights and everything in there and the notes and everything. Wow. Oh, there it is, all highlighted. And what are the odds of that? Zero. <laughs> and, and you're looking at, look at this, Ellie Wiesel Knight. Look at that. Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Me. I, that's that's what, right? <laughs> I want to say, when I told you your book was in the top three of books, that, that's probably my number one book. <laughs> Love that book. And, you know, and it, again, it comes down to people not wanting to read, not wanting to put the time in to learn and, and just take, like you say, cliff notes. That's all people they, 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 they even able to get through the cliff notes. That's all they care about. And uh, it's unfortunate because through ignorance, we're able to be controlled easily. Oh, easy. And then, easy, easy, easy. Well, listen, you text me your address. And I'm gonna put those books in the mail to you. Thank you enough for everything, and I and I want to stay in touch with you because I definitely want to come to your seminars. And like I said, if you're ever in the Orlando area, you know you're coming down. Just let me know in advance. I'll and I will take care of you while you're down here. So I, <laughs> sounds like a plan, Kurt. Well, okay. you take care and God bless, my brother. Thank you. You too. We'll talk uh, very soon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye bye.